Hello and welcome back. Today I want to talk about a couple narrowband transmission line based balance that I personally found quite interesting. One is commonly used for 1 to 1 impedance matching and the other is commonly used for 1 to 4 impedance matching. But once you look into the details a bit, you can get all sorts of other ratios as well. So if you're curious about that and much more, then keep watching. Especially with high frequency circuits, transmission line balance are quite common since these can be built relatively cheaply from some pieces of transmission line. But also they have quite good power handling capabilities. There's no core to saturate. But before looking into the examples of today, we first need to remember some of the properties of transmission lines onto which these circuits rely. So first of all, if a piece of transmission line has the electrical length equal to a quarter wavelength of the incoming signal, then the signal arriving at the end of the line will be phase shifted by 90 degrees in reference to the incoming signal. This phase shift can be increased of course by increasing the length of the line. So we will get 180 degrees for a half wavelength, so two quarter wavelengths, 270 degrees for three quarter wavelengths, and a full 360 degrees for one complete wavelength. Second important property is the impedance transformation presented by a quarter wavelength line. The impedance seen from one end is the impedance of the line squared divided by the load impedance. This works really nicely when working with resistive loads. So if you have the right line impedance, you can turn any load impedance into any other impedance. This property can be taken one step further when the line is a one half wavelength long. Here you get a double inversion. So the impedance at the middle of the line is equal to the line's impedance squared divided by the end impedance and the impedance at the beginning is again the line impedance squared divided by Z2 which works out to be exactly the impedance at the end. Now this does not sound all that interesting, however the interesting bit is that the input and output impedance are independent of the line's impedance. In other words, if you have a half wavelength of transmission line, the exact impedance of the line does not matter. It will still not present a discontinuity. And finally, since we're talking about differential signals today, we need to remember that a single-ended signal is the one where the signal travels on one line and the other one is a fixed voltage, usually the ground, and in a differential signal, we have two lines carrying 180 degrees phase shifted signals. So these are the signals that we need to somehow create using transmission lines in order to create a balen, something that takes the unbalanced signal and turns it into a balanced one. So let's continue by analyzing the one-to-one -one balen, the one that can be built with two sections of transmission line, one that has a quarter wavelength length, and the other that has a three quarter wavelength length. So first off, let's check the phase. How are the signals arriving at the load? Well, if we start off with a zero degrees reference signal, the signal on the quarter wavelength section will have a 90 degrees phase shift in reference to our input. And on the three quarter wavelengths branch, we will have a 270 degrees phase shift. So the exact signal arriving at the load, one branch in reference to the other, does have our desired 180 degrees of phase shift. The difference between these two values is 180. So we are getting a differential signal. Next, if we look at the impedance, we can first make the assumption that the balance balance side is well balanced. So our final load can be divided into two equal parts for each branch. Next, we can look at the impedance that is seen from one end of the quarter wavelength branch. So the impedance that we see will be the line's impedance squared divided by half of the load. On our other branch, if we consider it as being built from two sections, a single quarter wavelength and a half wavelength section, the quarter wavelength will give us the same impedance transformation that we see on our first branch, and while the half wavelength section does not impact the seen impedance. So the impedance that is seen at the other side of the three quarter wavelength line is the same as our first branch. 
So in this final node, we have the two impedances running in parallel, and that is what the input of the structure sees. And once you go through the calculations, the final impedance will be the lines impedance squared divided by our load impedance. And if we take a practical case in which the load is 50 ohms and the line has a characteristic impedance of again 50 ohms, then the impedance seen from the unbalanced side will again be 50 ohms. So when the line's impedance is equal to the source impedance, then the structure works as a one-to-one -one balan. We can now take a similar approach to the other structure, the one-to-four balan. So this one is built with a single half-wavelength transmission line section. So our input reference is the point that is directly connected to the load on one side and to the other through this transmission line. If we start off with our phase analysis, one side of the load obviously sees zero degrees of phase shift, it's directly connected to the feed point, and the other end sees exactly 180 degrees because of the half wavelength segment. So in this case, it's pretty obvious that the load sees two signals with exactly 180 degrees of phase shift in between them. So we have our differential signal. If we now continue with the impedance analysis, again, we can make the assumption that the balance balance side is well balanced. So the two points that are connecting the load to the balance see half of the load's impedance. So at our feed point, on the one side we have half of the load, and on the other side we have this half wavelength transmission line section, which does not impact the impedance. So this also sees half of the load impedance. So we can calculate our input impedance as being these two impedances in parallel, which finally adds up to the load impedance divided by four. So with this structure, the ratio between the input impedance and the load impedance will be one to four. Now, an important observation to be made with the structure is that the exact impedance of our half wavelength transmission line does not matter. Now, commonly this is built from the same line through which the incoming signal is being fed, but based on this operating principle, that is not really mandatory. You can make this section with any characteristic impedance. So let's now test the circuits in the simulator. So first, I prepared the 1 to 1 and 1 to 4 balans that take the signal from a 50 ohm signal source into a 50 and 200 ohm impedance load. Now the loads themselves are split in half with the middle being loosely connected to ground just to prevent any sort of simulation errors. And finally, the electrical length of the lines I used one nanosecond length as a quarter wavelength, so this corresponds to 250 megahertz. And then the two quarter wavelengths and three quarter wavelengths are two and three nanoseconds. So just to keep the numbers easy to follow. So now if we run the simulation and look at the signals in our first balan, so starting with the phase shift, if we zoom into the 250 megahertz point, so we can see our reference having a zero phase, so six milli-degrees. One of our signals, so the one that has three nanoseconds of length, has three quarter wavelengths, 270 degrees, and the other one that has only one quarter wavelength has 90 degrees. So the difference between the two is the 180 that we expect. Now, the other thing that we can notice at this particular frequency is the amplitude of our two signals, so the green and the blue one, which is identical. So we are getting our very nice differential signal the correct phase shift and the correct amplitude. We can also confirm the impedance of the structure by looking at the amplitude and phase at our injection point. So again, if we put our cursor to 250 megahertz, we can see that we are getting minus six decibels. So this is half of the initial input signal, which has 50 ohms of input impedance. So our structure is presenting another 50 ohms of impedance and the phase is again, zero degrees. So it's behaving like a resistive load. Point is, the balan is working as expected at this particular frequency point. Now, another thing that we can notice is that this behavior, the 6 dB attenuation and the zero degrees of phase is repeated at other frequencies as well. For example, at 750 megahertz, which is three times our initial value. So at this particular frequency, our two transmission line sections are behaving like a three quarter wavelength and a five quarter wavelength section. And well, we will see this behavior extending to even higher frequencies. 
So if we quickly simulate to say 5 gigahertz, the next point where this is happening is about 1.25 gigahertz, after that 1.75 and so on. So even though this is a narrow band Balen, it will work at odd frequency multiples of our initial frequency. So it doesn't work just at a single frequency. So now we can make the same analysis on our second Balen. So first of all, if we look at the signals at the output and just zoom into the 250 megahertz point, we will see we are getting 90 degrees of phase shift on one of the lines, 270 on the other. So this 90 degrees is coming from the initial section that is present here in the circuit. But regardless, the two signals are 180 degrees phase shifted. And while the amplitudes on the two lines, so the green and the blue one, are the same. So again, we are getting our nice differential signal. If we look at the signal coming from the reference, again, we will see our minus six decibel point with zero degrees of phase shift at 250 megahertz, and then at 750, and then at upper frequencies. So both of these structures behave more or less the same, just at different impedance ratios. And both of them are performing the task of matching a unbalanced signal to a balanced one. So these are very nice constructions when you need a one-to-one -one or one-to-four impedance transformation. But what if you need a different impedance ratio? Do you need a different structure? Or can you still take advantage of these and just adapt them a bit? Now, if we come back to the mathematics, we will notice that there are some things that we can change. In our first structure, when all of the impedances are equal, the input, the load, and the line, then it behaves like a one-to-one -one Balen. But since the line's impedance just needs to be equal to the square root of the input impedance times the load impedance, we can do different impedance ratios by simply choosing different line impedances. For example, we can create a 1 to 2 or a 2 to 1 impedance ratio starting from a 50 ohm input impedance by using 35 and 70 ohm transmission line and everything will be matched. So as long as you can use some non-standard impedance transmission line, you can match a wide variety of impedances using this structure. Now coming to our second structure, we have a bit of an issue. The input and the load impedance are not linked to the transmission line impedance. So regardless of the impedance of this bit, the same impedance ratio will occur. So as it is, we can only build a one to four impedance ratio. However, we can add an extra bit of quarter wavelength transmission line, and then we can start playing around with different impedances. So by adding in this section, the ratio of input impedance to load impedance will take into consideration the extra line impedance. So now we can start creating all sorts of ratios again. So just as an example, I calculated the impedance values for a 1 to 2 and a 1 to 1 impedance matching Palin using this type of structure. So starting with an input impedance of 50 ohms, we need a 35 ohms section of line for the 1 to 2 impedance ratio, or a 25 ohm section of line for the 1 to 1 impedance Balen. So again, because of this extra section of line, we can make all sorts of impedance ratios with this Balen. So just to make sure this really works, I prepared a simulation in which we can test out our calculated circuits. So starting off with the first type of Balen, I prepared the circuits that are operating at 250 megahertz with the various impedance ratios. So our initial one to one, the two to one impedance and the one to two impedance ratios. And if we just plot out the signals coming from the signal source, we can see that for all three types of circuit, at our 250 megahertz point, all of them have exactly the same amplitude, minus six decibels, and the exact same phase, zero degrees. So all of these circuits are performing the impedance matching task. The only difference that does seem to appear is the exact bandwidth. So when the balance side impedance is higher than the input, we have a slightly wider bandwidth, so with this red line, and when the output impedance is smaller, we have a slightly smaller bandwidth, so the blue line. And in a similar fashion, for our second type of Balen, I created the circuits for the one to four impedance ratio, one to two, and the one to one. And again, if we plot all these three out, we will see the same behavior at 
250 megahertz where everything is being properly matched. So we have our minus 6 dB attenuation and the zero phase shift. And again, we can see different behaviors in the bandwidth. So just because these two types of Balon are commonly used as 1 to 1 and 1 to 4 impedance transformers, does not mean that this is the only impedance transformation that can be obtained. As long as you have the correct impedance of transmission line, you can get all sorts of other values. Last thing to look at today is just what type of operating mode these two kinds of valence have. Are they voltage or current valence? And for that, I prepared a set of circuits in which the load is unbalanced. So this way we can observe which electrical parameter is being balanced. So if we run a simulation, start off with our first one-to-one -one balen, and we just plot out the output voltages and the currents running through the two sections of line, and we look at the 250 megahertz point, so where the balen is supposed to be balancing, well, what we can notice is that the voltages, so the blue and green lines, are clearly different in between the two lines, but the currents do seem to be the same through both branches. So this structure is showing the typical behavior of a current balon. If we now look at our second circuit, so again plot out the two output voltages and the two currents, well we get a slightly different behavior. The two voltages, so the green and the pink, are exactly the same at 250 MHz, but the two currents, blue and red, have a clear difference. So the second circuit is showing a voltage balon behavior. So even though the two circuits seem to be quite similar, they are balancing different electrical parameters. In the end, both of these types of Balen are commonly used in practice, and at least in theory and simulation, they behave as expected. But just to confirm the various topics discussed today, next time I will try to build and test a set of these Balens in real life. But for now, Hope you got some useful information after this, leave your thoughts in the comments, thank you for watching, make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my videos, and see you next time. Bye bye.